Hi there, I'm Jonathan Fields, and this is Good Life Project. So my guest today is my friend Michael Port. And Michael, um, besides ruling the world, has written, uh, I think, somewhere between four and 100 New York Times best-selling books. Book Yourself Solid. Uh, Beyond Book Solid. Beyond Book Solid. The Contrarian Effect. Contrarian Effect. The and Think Big Manifesto. The Think Big Manifesto. And now, and now Book Yourself Solid Illustrated, Illustrated, which is what we're going to be talking about at some point today, yeah, woven in. So great to be hanging out with great you. Great to be here. I'm so happy to be here. Ah, so, um, okay, first, we have all sorts of important things to talk about, but um, I don't think we can really start with anything other than your shoes. Yes, I think you're right. This is... Uh, uh, this is a statement, I hope. I love these shoes. You know, I have a relationship with Reebok now, and they, they give me all this stuff. And, you know, nothing better than free stuff. Of course. But I actually love everywhere I go, people comment on these shoes. And I like that, you know. I, I have to have I have complain to about that. that. So anyhow. So let's move on from the shoes now and talk about less important things. Um, you and I share some interesting parallels. And, and, uh, and I want to talk about the, sort of like the latest version of Book Yourself Style, the Illustrated sure. Edition. But let's zoom the lens back in time and um, explore your journey a little bit um, and kind of how you started in, you know, right now you're doing something, you're writing books, you're training, you're teaching people really how to build business and book, book all sorts of sales. And, yeah. But um, how did you start out in sort of like the world of Michael Port's, you know, fabulous career? Um, well, I started out as like a little chubby, insecure kid <laughs> um, who, uh, you know, who just wanted, I think, approval. And I think that when you, when you want approval, you, you often learn how to be relevant. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if you're smart about it. And so uh, I was naturally a good storyteller. I was naturally, um, I would say, a good marketer. Because I, I wanted people to go, oh, I like that guy. I want to invite him to the party. Yeah, so it's I want personal. to hang out with him. So, you know, how do you, right. how do you make any environment that you're in a little bit better because you're there? So I, I, I guess um, I thought a lot like that. And, and, of course, if you want a lot of approval, you become an actor. So that's, what I, that's how I started. Now, right. of course, at the time I would say, no, 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 I'm not doing this for the applause. I'm, I'm doing this because I want to study people and I want to, you know, right. and of course. All and the, the art form. And the art form, you know, uh, and of course I ended up on soap operas. But it, all of that is true. I mean, I think I learned a tremendous amount about um, the human dynamic studying uh, theater. Hmm. Um, and I loved it. I really did. I loved it so much. I, I went to grad school at NYU. Um, and I got a master's in fine arts and acting. And um, I worked for about four years and I had a modicum of success. I did shows like Sex and the City and Third Watch and All My Children, as I said, and uh, Law and Order and a um, whole bunch of other ones. But it was a very hard lifestyle for me because you spend most of your time waiting. Right. Right, sitting around and waiting for other people to give you a job. I don't like that idea of someone else deciding whether I work or not. Letting somebody else choose you, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and you know, then of course there is a lot of rejection and so there's a lot of up and downs right. and that, I found that difficult as well. Uh, but that whole line, I mean, you know, I used to own a yoga studio in Manhattan and yeah. it was Hell's Kitchen. So yeah. most of our, our community yeah. were actors, singers, and dancers. Yeah. So I was around them all day long for yeah. a, a lot of years. And I mean, from the outside looking in, it just seemed like such a brutal life. Yeah, it's tough. You know, like all day long going out and just showing up somewhere and hoping and praying that you're good enough for somebody to give you a stamp of approval and say you've got the job. And then you have the job for a certain window and then it's over. And you have to over. do the whole thing so over So you could do really, really well, and, but your future is always uncertain. Right. And we need to be comfortable with that discomfort, but you have to want to do that so much that there's nothing else you would rather do, yeah. and there's almost nothing else you could do. You couldn't even imagine yourself doing something yeah. else. And you have to be patient. And yeah. I, I, was, I, I was not patient. I've never been accused of being patient in my entire <laughs> life. Um, and I felt there was all these different things I could do, and I, I could do them quickly and on my own. So mm. I talked my way into a job in the fitness industry for which I was completely unqualified. But the woman hired me because she said, I think... And we share that similarity, by the way. <laughs> yes, exactly. Not the unqualified part, no, but the... No, we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lawyer one day, personal trainer, like three Ex days later. Exactly <laughs> right. Yeah. So, um, but she said, she said, I'm going to, you know, pass you on and you can go, you know, your next interview will be with the senior vice president. And I said, well, I'm not going to lie that I don't have these qualifications, like the A certification and mm. this and then that. She goes, no, 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 it's never going to come up because if I send you there, clearly you would have them. So she's mm. not going to ask you. 
I said, why are you doing this? She goes, well, I'm leaving the company. <laughs> I said, well, you don't like them? You want to? No, she goes, no, no, no. I think because you don't know much about our industry, you could do really well. Huh. Because yeah. I like the way you think, very you know, strategic and, and process oriented, et cetera. And you understand how to create experiences, which is what um, theater and film is about. Right, yeah. And that's what, to a certain extent, um, uh, group exercise is like in, you know, in the fitness industry. No. Anyhow, so I got the job and I did really well in large part because I didn't know how things were done. So the no. way I made them up was just sometimes a little bit newer. Um, but then, of course, you had to work for somebody else. Mm. That was a problem. Um, and uh, I had, again, I went, moved around in that business for a little while and I did okay. But I just wanted to do something on my own. I wanted this ability to be fully self-expressed in whatever I did. No. I wanted, you know, this... I wanted to essentially make or break myself so that if something's holding me back, it's not anybody else. It's only me. Right. And then that gives me an opportunity to develop professionally, but also personally. Because I don't think there's a, a big difference between the two. I think business, de business development and, and creative development, whatever you're doing, but especially entrepreneurship. Oh, totally the same. It's an, it's yeah, an it's opportunity all, for personal development. Absolutely. I mean, thing. it's an outgrowth. Yeah. You know, it's like so many people, like I see hit a wall, the entrepreneurs hit a wall professionally and they're wondering yeah. what can I fix, how can I market better, how can yeah. I change the product, how can I shift the business model to get through this threshold. Yeah. And what they're not looking at is how can I grow me? Yeah. Like how can I actually grow myself? How can I make you know, myself more capable of doing this, more insightful, more creative, more mm -hmm. stronger, you know, like feed myself better, whatever it yeah. may be. They never examine the fact that they may actually be the limiting factor. Sure. It's always got to be something external. Well, I think a lot of our business problems are just personal problems in disguise, yeah. right? So if I if if there's big if I can't keep people on my team, well, that's a personal problem. Mm. That's not the oh there's, I can't find good people. Right. That's the biggest load of you know. Can you I say can crap? Say, Thank you. Crap. You, say, you can say whatever you want. Thank here. you. Um, that's the least of one. Yeah, people you know, say. I mean, that's that's small thinking. This idea that there's no good people out there. Well, if you're losing them, there's a personal reason that they're not staying with you. Yeah. Right. If you're if you're if you can't put together processes uh, to improve, you know, the workflow or the production. Well, maybe that's a that's an outgrowth of your disorganization. Mm. You know, the the entrepreneur who starts this venture um, is responsible for its personality. Yeah. So. And which is also one of the gifts. I mean, so many people have asked me over the years, what's the coolest thing about being an entrepreneur? Yeah. Is it the money? Is it the control? And you're like, well, especially in the early days, it's neither. It's, yeah, it's <laughs> definitely not the money in the early days. It's definitely not the money. It's not right. the shortest. Like, oh, you can work when you want and not work when you, no, 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 no. Yeah. And to me, it's always been the best thing about creating your own thing is that you get to choose who you surround yourself with on yeah. a daily basis. You create the culture. Totally. You build it so it's fully aligned with who you are. If you bring that awareness of what you really want to build and the culture yeah. that you want to build and the people you want around you to the space and you build out around that rather than some sort of you know external metric that yeah. somebody else you should be, you know, that That's should be That's a really big statement around. that you made. It just sort of put, brought me back 15 years or so when, when you, you did not have a choice. You did not choose who you work with. Mm. You would sit all day long working with people. Yeah. You had no choice. Yeah. And these, these people you spent all your time with, they might have been lovely people, but not for you. Right, right? exactly. It's yeah. not a, you're not passing judgment on who they are. Great. Yeah. But they're not your people. Right. And I think we discount so much mm -hmm. the importance of having so your true. people around you. You're like, yeah. oh, well, the money's right. You know, like the, it's, it's prestige. You know, yeah. I've got a great business card. Yeah. And, you know, the, where I'm going to in this, I'm going to make partner yeah. or vice president or whatever it is. And, and it's a good company. Yeah. And it's respected. You know, but it's, it's interesting. Not me. The, the word prestige is really interesting because when I first started, I loved that idea. Mm. Like, I loved the applause. I loved the fact that I could, you know, write these books. And, I, and it is the least interesting thing to me now. Mm. So, what shifted? Like, what, how does that happen? Well, sometimes it happens when you uh, actually achieve some success, right? Because then mm. you feel good. But also, you know, it got to the point where um, I recognized that it does absolutely nothing for my psyche. Mm. Nothing, nothing good whatsoever. And, um, you know, when I really investigate um, w what makes me feel whole, I think it's just being real, meaning who I actually am. Mm. Not trying to be something more, not certainly being less, but just trying to find day in and day out that, that place of, um, of honesty or truth, of 
this is who I am mm -hmm. today, and I'm cool with that. Nice. And if that means I'm selling a billion books, great. If it means, you know, nobody wants to buy the latest book, that's okay too. But I just sort of keep trying to find that, that center, I suppose. Nah. You know? Not always easy, but I try. It, I mean, it's not always easy. And I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of people back away from this, because it's hard work. You know, yeah. so in theory, you should just know who you are. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, this is who I am. This is what I need in yeah. the world. This is what I like. This is what I don't like. This is who I like. It's who yeah. I don't like. Yeah. And let me just go claim what's mine. Like, yeah. let me claim my place, my people, my... Yeah. Um, but I think so many people were so disconnected. Yeah. Uh, I think there's so many, either through our own, the lenses that we erect, the way that we see the world, and through just so many people telling us how we're supposed to see the world and yeah. the actions that we're supposed to take in the world, that we build structures around us and we build filters yeah. that make it almost impossible to actually see, like, what, what do we... Like, what's that voice inside of me that says, screw everybody else? Yeah. This is like when I wake up in the morning, these are the people who, when I'm around them, I'm most myself. You know, yeah, like, this right, is the setting. Right, right. This is the product or the service or the company. Like, these yeah. are the, this is the culture where I, I'm fully alive. Yeah. You know, like, forget about whether it's good or bad or tons of money or no money, but like, when I'm in this place, when I'm painting, when I'm writing, when I'm speaking, whatever it may be, like, I feel like I could be here forever. Yeah. Yet simultaneously, time goes in the blink sure. of an eye. And uh, I think we've become so disconnected from just understanding like, what allows us to exist in this state of you know, congruence. Yeah. With I, I feel when I when I start to lose that that sense of um, uh, of grace or or wholeness, it's often a, a result of judging other people. Mm, that's interesting. Talk to me more about that. Well, you know, what, I really, really, really work hard not to judge other people. Um, you know, I've never, I, I've, I'm always amazed when, when uh, somebody so easily uh, puts somebody down that they don't know, right? And certainly that they do know, but, um, you know, we see it all the time online. It's, yeah. it's really quite extraordinary. Um, but it's, you, you don't have to um, get angry or dislike or think somebody's a horrible person because you're not crazy about what they produced, Right. Um, or the, the particular technique they use for something, whatever it is, you know? And I just, I spent so many years in, um, in different industries, whether it was acting or fitness or book writing, the speaking circuit. Um, I spent, you know, years and years in martial arts, different martial arts. And, you know, over time, you, you would you consistently hear and see one group judging another group. Mm. Well, the, I mean, martial arts is a perfect example. It's like, you know, oh, well, you know, that, those people in Aikido, they, that's not really real. Or those people in Jiu-Jitsu, they have no real respect for it. You know, whatever mm -hmm. it is. And uh, there are no those people, right? We are all the same, no matter how, you know, you know, someone's very progressive, somebody's tea party. Essentially, we're all, you know, human beings trying to find some way in the world. Yeah. And we might disagree with each other, but, um, but I find when I'm judging others is when um, I respect myself the least. Mm. So... That, that's something that I really work on, and I find that um, very helpful in my work, too, because uh, then my work is not a response to other people's work. Mm. It, it's not some sort right. of trying to show, well, this is the right way. There is no right way. There's just, you know, whatever way you choose to go. So that I find the work gets easier. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, actually. And I like people more, more tolerant that way. Yeah. Right? Because you're not judging them as much. Right, and it also gives you pause to sort of say, okay, oh, wait a minute. Why, like, what's behind this? Yeah. You know, and if I'm judging them, then um, you know, if it's really something in myself that I'm judging, okay, yeah. what's really going on here? What yeah. can I learn from that? Yeah. Um, or it's, you know, why you're judging them Why? because they're getting more attention than you are, right? right? And you're like, well, their stuff sucks. Why are they getting more attention? Well, maybe they're just... I've uh, never said that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it's I'm like, so much better. Yeah, right. You they're know? so much more famous. <laughs> yeah. It, maybe they, you know, are... Again, I've never said that. No, I know. Um, but no, but it's like, you know, you, we sometimes go, well, maybe, what are they doing that is re people really resonating nah. with? You know, maybe it's, you know, uh, something that we're not comfortable with, or maybe it's that we don't recognize that they actually are really, really take care of the people around them. Mm. Maybe they do something special for people that we're just not seeing, you know? Yeah. So, um, so anyhow, so I just, I work to not judge too much. I yeah. try. So let's kind of circle back. Um, so you're kind of in the fitness industry, bopping around and starting to realize, okay, yeah. Mm, I need to, to be out on my own. I need to be sort of claiming my own future. Yeah. Yeah. Where do you go from there? 
Well, I actually, um, before I did that, I got um, a job back in the entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. I was uh, the vice president of alternative programming for a vertically integrated film production and, the and distribution company, which basically meant I didn't do anything. Like, I, I was there to try to, like, come up with random ideas to do uh -huh. cool programming in the art house theaters, but it, it, was, uh, it was going nowhere. And so, ever walked into a place, and the day you walk in, you go, I think this is the beginning of the end. <laughs> yeah. So I said, okay, well, I know my bonus comes in That's my nine first months. job as a lawyer. Actually. Yeah, there you go, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, not nine months, I said my bonus comes. I'm going to work, you know, fulfill my obligation for these nine months, do everything that, you know, I am committed to do. And at the same time, tr try to figure out what, you know, uh, I was going to do with myself. And I met this woman, who, wonderful woman named Molly Fox, amazing woman. And uh, she was doing this life coaching. I thought, mm. I could do that. I think that's really natural for me. She said, I think it is. So I, I enrolled in a coaching school and I lasted two weeks because I was going so slow. I'm like, come on, come on, come on, let's get going, you know? And, um, and so then I, I, I just went out and did. I mean, I just put myself in that position, in that situation where um, I felt like if I could be in service to others, if I could be helpful to others, then the rest would fall into place. Mm. I didn't have to have... I mean, I was a little worried at the beginning about not having credentials. You know, I come from this academic family. I, I'm not academic at all. But everybody around me is very, very yeah. academic. Um, I worried about that a little bit, but I, I tried not to. I tried to focus on just being helpful because I felt like the other stuff is not what's relevant. It doesn't matter what your initials you have after but, your name. Yeah. Just can you be helpful? Um, and I quickly realized that life coaching wasn't for me because it sort of turned into this idea of like, very therapeutic and you know that I didn't I had you know didn't wasn't trained for and is not something I wanted to do mm. um, and I also realized that in the industry people don't really they don't really buy life coaching unless it's from like Tony Robbins who's really famous you know it just didn't make sense so I started to identify like well what did I do when I was in the fitness industry that I did well what do I understand um, uh, in, in, that I could bring some expertise to with some some credibility and it was branding mm. Not big corporate branding, but individual. Because I, you know, when I was in the fitness industry, that you know, we had like hundreds and hundreds of individuals yeah, right. who would work for us, and you, you know, I really got to see well who did well and why. Right. And yeah. you get and you get metrics every day: yeah. whose classes are packed, whose schedules. Totally. Packed. Yeah. And so that's what I started helping people with. And I first focused on the fitness industry because I had some um, right back uh, on that. Yeah, yeah, some background there. Uh, and that was it. I focused on personal brand development. And then, of course, ultimately, if you ask a thousand. Um, say fitness professionals, well, what do you want? It's more clients. Mm. I mean, they'll say, you know, all bunch of different things, but the majority of them will say, I need more clients, I need more business. So I started to figure out, well, how can I uh, move beyond just doing branding? How can I expand from there? And then, and then I did, I started, you know, trying to figure out how can I develop some sort of process that people can work through. And, um, you know, I was very dyslexic when I was young, and I still am. And I had, I think uh, it takes me, like I have to read uh, a book a few times before I get all of it. Like I'll read a page and go, what did I just read? It's sort of the opposite of an attorney. An attorney goes, got it, right? Um, and so I, what, I was, what I learned to do is to try, take all these different concepts and ideas and reorganize them into, into simpler terms, hmm. sort of the core of it. And it's interesting because the Calvin Foundation did a study on entrepreneur, entrepreneurship and dyslexia. And they found that a, a disproportionately larger number of of entrepreneurs I, are dyslexic. I saw that. It's huge. Yeah, it's huge. Yeah. And, and they, they found four reasons, they thought. Number one, um, they, they tend to be good problem solvers. Right. Because, you know, you get all this information yeah, coming yeah. in, you got to figure it out. Number two, um, they didn't do well in the corporate world because the, the structures were set by right. somebody else. Uh, number three, they're good verbal communicators because they needed to develop that skill. Right. And number four, and this was the most interesting, they're very good at getting other people to do their work for them. Mm, right. So, for example, the Book Yourself Solid Illustrated, best book I've ever done, coolest project I've ever done. I did almost none of it. <laughs> really. Jocelyn Wallace, the illustrator, the visual strategist, right. took my material, and I worked with her, of course, but we cut two-thirds out of it, and now it's all these illustrations created mm. by her, not by me. Right. So um, you, 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 you get comfortable with collaborating because you can't do it all yourself mm. when you're dyslexic. You just can't handle it. It, doesn't, you know, it can't work for you. And you're okay with not taking the credit. Right. Yeah. So over time, 
you know, I've been able to focus on results rather than approval. Results rather than approval. Hmm. And I figured if, if, I can, if I can help people around me get the approval that they want, you know, have the opportunity to produce the kind of work that's meaningful to them, that gives them the feeling of full self-expression, well then, um, then we can produce results. And it's not ultimately about me, which is kind of cool. Hmm. So is this where the first book comes from? The very first book? Yeah. Well, Mean Book Yourself Solid? Yeah. Um, was that your first or was Book this Book Yourself Solid was right. first. That was the first, right? It, it came from um, trying to build this, this process for figuring out how to get clients based on all this information that I was, I was studying, which was hard for me to, um, unless, I, unless I organized it into some sort of progressive, sequential uh, process, I couldn't yeah. figure out what am I supposed to do next. Yeah. So I had to do that. Um, and that's, that's where that started. Um, but the illustrated version is going back to the very first book and you know, doing it as a completely new book. So what makes you, I mean, it's interesting because uh, you know, you've had tremendous success in, in a number of different levels now and, and an amazing personal brand. Um, you wear really cool sneakers. Right, right, right. <laughs> and, um, and you go back to a book now that was a tremendous success, changed a lot of people's lives and careers yeah. to create this illustrated version a lot of people would kind of be like, okay, this was a really big success. It stands yeah, alone still. Yeah, why mess still. with it, right? Why would I screw with it? Because yeah. it's a good thing. And yeah. if I go back to something like that, I see so much fear around this in a variety of different projects and businesses. Like, let's not go back and try and spin it differently or make it better or make it accessible to other because it's good. Yeah. So Well, let, I mean, let's look at it from two different angles. The first angle is I'm a maximizer. So I don't want to do something if it's going to be good. I want to do it if it's going to be great. Right. Otherwise, it's boring. So how can I keep making something better is always obsessively on my mind. Um, and I, I knew that, well, there's a lot of people who don't love to read. I mean, I, I don't want to read all day long. I want to play. I want to do stuff. Right. So how can you help solve the problem for them? I said, well, maybe we could make it visual if so many people are visual learners. So that was one thing. That's the improvement part. Right. But the other part, just from a, a strategic perspective, is you know, I wrote four books in four years. And as I alluded to in the beginning, I think one of the reasons I did it <laughs> is because I wanted to make sure that nobody thought I was some stupid dyslexic kid huh. who, you know, still couldn't spell, which right. I can't, you know. My, my, um, my signature on I my know, email <laughs> said, you know, uh, what do I say? T um, it's like typos courtesy of us. Yeah, yeah, my, like you know, typos right. uh, uh, are, you know, are free. They're my gift to you. Right. I don't charge for typos, right. that's what I said. Um, and um, I think that was part of it. But... The problem is, when you keep producing, 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 you have no time to leverage what you've produced. Mm. And so if I look back and I think, well, you know, that first book went really well, I should have been strategically continuing to develop on that first idea. Mm. And eventually people say like, well, why don't you do something different? Why don't you do something different? And, um, and I want to because I like that newness and the difference, but from a very sort of strategic perspective and a pragmatic perspective, mm. um, it makes sense to take something that works and figure out how you can continue to leverage it, um, repurpose it, um, you know, not so that you milk it dry so that it's it becomes watered down, right? Right. Although milking it dry and watered down oh. are two opposite analogies, but you get my point. Um, um, but how can you continue to add life to it? How can you continue to allow it to grow? Because, you know, you've written tons of books. You, once you give it to the publisher, that's all you can do. Yeah. And you, but it's not, I mean, it's not really done. It's, right. nothing, it's, no, it's never done. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, what holds a lot of folks up is this, wow, well, it's not perfect. It's not done yet. It's yeah. never done. So here's the best it's going to be for now. It's good enough to go out there in the world with. I feel that it could be better, but I'm out of time. So this is what I put out mm. and I'm willing to put that out, but I'm going to figure out a way to keep going and keep making it better. Mm. You know, so, and I just think it's fun. So has this been sitting on your mind for like the last four years or, or is this something which just kind of came to you like, oh, this is a really cool new idea. And it could add value, it could expand it. To yeah, no, no, I met this woman. So the, uh, literally that conversation, the meeting her was a catalyst for this. Totally. Huh. I mean, I, it's interesting because I think the best partnerships are the kind of partnerships where you each feel like you got the better end of the deal. Hmm. You know, like if we're doing something, I'm like, I'm so fucking lucky. I'm the lucky one, right? <laughs> and John is going, I'm so lucky. I'm the lucky one. That's the best kind of, you know, deal. Yeah, so, yeah. And I feel that with Jocelyn in this project. And when I met her, I was giving a speech and she was at the event drawing on her computer and it was showing up on the screen 
It's pretty oh, cool. so she was like a graphic note taker, illustrator. For exactly. One of you know, you see sometimes they draw yeah, on the walls. Yeah, I've had that done with me too, and I was amazed. It's amazing, amazed. right? Yeah. But she was doing it on the screen. Uh, it was behind me. You know, I kept going. That's right. really cool. You know, so um, like losing your track the whole time. And so I'm thinking, as soon as I saw it, I went, mm, "I think we could probably do something huh. with this." And just recently, I was talking to her about this, and I said, "You know, it was I got this idea, and I came up and found you, and I said we should talk about this." She goes, "No, that's not what happened." So what do you mean? She goes, no, I wanted to meet you because I thought there was something to do. So I got ah. myself to that event because I wanted to do books with successful authors instead of trying to do something from scratch, mm. reorganize their information because I can make it better. And I went to the event and I was, I was nervous to just go up and be like, you know, hey, I'm yeah. Jocelyn. So she found someone who she knew, who knew me, made the introduction, and we started talking. She said, hey, I'd like to talk to you about doing something. But that's not how I remember it. I remember it as I went to her. Huh. So what's interesting to me about that, you know, she knew she did, wasn't confused. I was the one who was confused, and and the reason I think that's interesting is because it demonstrates to me how important the project is and how great I think it is that, that I must have come up with it myself. Yeah, <laughs> you see, that's, that's all, and there's such a great lesson in what she did also. Yeah, right. Because how many artists are out there, or you know, like illustrators are out there trying to figure out how do I make a buck, but like keep doing really cool stuff, yeah. work with people, collaborate with people I really want to collaborate with, yeah. and get paid in you know, a decent chunk of change yeah. to actually do it. Yeah. And if they follow and the traditional this, things, I, this I I, I, mean, I guess this is okay to say here it'll go out, but she, I giving her a larger percent of the royalties on this book. Mm. Now, we know that royalties, unless you're selling you know, millions and millions of copies, it's not a huge amount right. of money, right? Most of your money on books is uh, on the, the back end of the book, right. what comes from it. Um, but nonetheless, there's going to be money there. So I'm not giving her the money, I'm not giving her the royalties on the franchise, right. but on this particular project, because I felt she's doing more work on this particular yeah. book. And there's a huge benefit in terms of brand association also, in association yeah. with you. Yeah, yeah. So it's just it's a great example of somebody saying, okay, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna change the way that the normal business model operates in yeah. the space for artists and illustrators. I'm gonna go find like so like I'm gonna target people. I'm gonna stalk Michael yeah, Port, totally. right, and go and find a way to get into his orbit, yeah. and actually give him something. Yeah, you know, like so she gave you the gift of this thing going up, and you're like, holy crap, this is so cool. Yeah, to the extent that your your memory is like, I wanted yeah. to find her. I mean, look, there's no there's no doubt, and you know, I'm I'm not so special or so famous that. I'll make somebody else famous, right? But there's no doubt when this book comes out, she's going to have offers one after the other, after yeah. the other, after the other, because it's really extraordinary. Yeah, what she's done here. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean that's I, I love the whole process too. Yeah. Um, so the the book is really designed. It's all the core stuff from and what was I mean for those who haven't read, you know, the, the first one was a massive bestseller. Yeah. For those who haven't read, what was the core idea behind it? Well, I, I believe there are certain people you're meant to serve and others that you're not. And your job is to work as hard as you can to find the people you're meant to serve. But you'll find them when you show up fully self-expressed. Mm. And so most marketing books are tactical. So they focus on do this, do this, do this, do this. And obviously that's important. But if you go out and try to do public speaking or networking or you know, pay-per-click advertising or SEO, mm. or whatever, but you don't have a really solid foundation built, and you don't know how to build trust and credibility over time, and you don't know how to price your offers, and you don't know how to have simple sales conversations, nah. then all that you know, marketing was probably for naught. Nah. Because what happens is somebody becomes aware of you, right? So here's a couple of little marketing things you're doing. Oh, I'm aware of Jonathan. Well, now I'll go over and check Jonathan out. And if his foundation is, feels like I should be standing on it, like it was made for me, I feel mm -hmm. strong and secure and comfortable, nah. then I'll stay. Nah. But does that mean I'm gonna hire him? Not, that, not, nah. not, not necessarily. I want to see if what he stands for is what I resonate with, right? Because I know he helps me do what I want, but do I connect with him philosophically, emotionally, et cetera? Right. And in order for the person to know that, they need to know, you need to be fully self-expressed, yeah. right? So that foundation is essential. And then the process of building trust and credibility takes time because I think we should only make sales offers that are proportionate to the amount of trust that we've earned. Mm. Say that again. We should only make sales offers that are proportionate to the amount of trust that we've earned. And one of the reasons sales offers don't work is because they're too big, mm. right? So I, I never, when I first started, you know, I used public speaking a lot because it was, it was very easy for me. And um, I go to these events and everybody's just selling stuff from the stage, like pitching from the stage. Yeah. And I go, I'm not comfortable because if my mom saw me do that, she wouldn't like that. Yeah. <laughs> it just really, it was not, I was not comfortable with it. So I had to figure out a way 
to um, to still help you know still get people to go. Oh, I want to do more with him. Okay, okay. Uh, I get to that in a minute. But the point was this: the, the reason that those didn't feel comfortable to me is because you're making like a thirty thousand dollar offer to people that. For, this is the first time they've ever seen yeah, it. so there was that mismatch. It's dis, it's, nah. And it's a perfect example of nah. it because most people have been in that situation right. and you're like, nah. uh -huh. and then some will say, but it works and blah, blah, blah. We could get into that, you right. know, that debate later on. But um, so I had this, I had said, well, how do you, how do you, how, what do you do instead? So I said, well, um, I got to come up with and always have something to invite people to offer. Mm. Something that I can invite people to, there's no, no barrier to entry, right. no risk, no strings. But it's consistent and it's frequent and it brings people together. Because if you bring people together, then you stand as a leader. Mm, yeah. Even if you're not teaching them what you know, you know what you for what you do, you're not selling anything. Just the fact that you're able to bring people together demonstrates a certain level of gravitas. Mm, yeah. um, and then, of course, uh, if you are consistently and frequently um, serving others without asking for anything in return. Well, you become very relevant, right? And, and the so trust level time, goes up exactly. Right. So, um, so you know, see, these are some of the uh, foundational or fundamental, I should say, principles of book yourself solid. And I think that for people who don't typically love marketing and selling, they go, "I get it. Yeah. I get it. I love it. I can do this. This feels comfortable yeah. to me and real to me." And that's why I remember the first time I read it, I was like, "That's exactly what I'm, I'm saying to myself." Yeah. I'm like, "Yeah." This just, it feels in part what I already do, yeah. but it's kind of validating it and giving a better framework. Yes, do you know, that's so interesting you said it because a lot of people will say to me, you know, I kind of felt like that already mm. or I kind of knew that, but I, it validated. Yeah. That. And what's interesting is a lot of people when they want to write books or they have a desire to, um, to be in the sort of knowledge business, they get very nervous. Like, what do I have to say that hasn't been said? Mm. And of course, what we're trying to do is we're trying to, to, to share our beliefs in the hopes that they'll help others, but with our voice fully, our style, our tone, etc. And sometimes just validating what somebody else already knows or thinks is huge. Is huge. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be so new, so different, never even, you know, no one's ever thought of this marketing technique in the world. No, no, no. no. It has to connect with them emotionally. And sometimes just validating is what, you know, is what connects. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's so powerful. And I get the same question all the time. People yeah. are like, what do I have to add? I'm like... Yourself. Yourself, your yeah. voice, your stories, yeah. and you know, your, your lens. Yeah. You know, you, maybe from a pure information standpoint, it's all out there. Yeah. But the way you synthesize, and like, you're, you're, so there, there's something you can bring to that. I like the way you say that, your lens. You know, the yeah. way you see the world. Yeah, because yeah. certain people will just resonate with that. Right. And the way that you, you bring ideas together, yeah. We'll just allow it to click. So here's for somebody a perfect example. Else. Okay, so you taught big, full, packed yoga classes, right? You right. own this studio, and um, most yoga teachers really want to help. I mean, they're like really in service right. in a big way. And so um, when I, I, you know, I taught yoga, right. yeah, um, for maybe like a year and a half, and I was never the best yogi in the world physically. Mm. I mean, um, but I, it was all about self-expression. That was my idea. So I taught mm. a kind of class that was unique and was resonate with certain people and every once in a while so there'd be 50 people in the room one person would come in always in the back corner and like every single problem that they had was your fault they're like oh, oh, you know everything and and doing everything they can right. to make sure that you know they're miserable so what right. do we do we go are you okay is everything okay is, is, is there something i can do to be right. different or change and and as a result what those 49 other people say hello right, yeah they feel completely abandoned yeah, and so instead of doing that, what we should be doing is bringing more of whatever it is we are doing. Right. So they either leave, or they go. Yeah. All right, I'm going to try it because I can't push this person around. And it's a good thing if they, that, that they leave because they'll find somebody else where they want to be in that room, and then you right. will find your people. I really, I think, I think it really is true that we should only work with the people we do our best work because I it's agree. out of integrity to them too. Absolutely. Oh, well, they got a pulse. They got a checkbook. We I should hire I them. Mean, I mean, I've, I've fired many clients. Yeah. Because it, what I wasn't getting. I forget about the money. Yeah. I wasn't getting what I needed beyond that. Just, so now a lot of people will look at us and they will look at you and say, "Wow, well, John's got a lot of money, and you know, Michael's done success." Well, it's easier for them to say, right? But I think you did this from the beginning. 
I, I, I did. I yeah. mean, and I, and I continue to do it, and I, and I will always do that yeah. because life's too short. Because to spend it creates all of your the space time, right. to make all that money, right. to exactly. have the right I mean, plans. if your schedule is booked, boom, 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 with yeah. people, and 48.9% you know, of those you can't wait to not work with, yeah. but you can't, you're still working with them, yeah. you never allow the room for the, the right people to come into your schedule. Yeah. So you've got this, so, so basically the cool thing is you're, you're taking all these awesome concepts and you came out, you changed millions of people's lives with this a couple of years back, and now you're sort of like bringing this whole new idea to open up the world of visual learners mm -hmm. to these concepts and really change a lot of lives also. And um, I love the fact that, that, you know, for the years that we've known each other, you're, you're constantly, your nonstop ideas and your nonstop action, but also fundamentally driving that is this, this sense of service that yeah. pervades everything. Yeah. And it's, I think people resonate with that. So, so the name of this project is called Good Life Project. Oh, that's so cool. When I offer you the term to live a good life, what comes up? What is that? What resonates around that term with you? For me, it's peacefulness. I just want to lay my head down at night and feel peaceful. That, to me, you know, ha Having that as a as a as a standard way of being would just be the most glorious thing in the world because that's not how I feel at the end of every day. Sometimes I do, usually when I'm on my boat and it's been a really beautiful day. But no, that to me is is what like the for Michael Port's Good Life Project, you know, would would just be that peacefulness. And to mm -hmm. me, that's a, a think big revolution. That's that's a revolution, you know, uh, for me personally to be able to just be peaceful all the time. Mm -hmm. I'd love that. Can you help yeah. me with that? I guarantee it. Awesome. Money back. <laughs> anyway, it's awesome hanging out with you so Thanks, much man. for the conversation. So I'm Jonathan Fields, and today we've been hanging out with uh, my friend Michael Port, signing off for Good Life Project. Mm -hmm.